and welcome to the dissertation defense for Dr. for Ms. <laughs> chair of the dissertation um, committee. Other members of the committee are Dr. Bertha Davis, Professor, School of Nursing, Dr. Zena McGee, Professor, School of Liberal Arts and Education, and Dr. Delroy Loudon, Professor, Lincoln University, Pennsylvania, who is on the phone with us today from British West Indies. Good afternoon, Dr. Loudon. Hi, greetings and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we also have in the audience Dr. Donald Whitney, Dean of the Graduate College, Dr. Constance Hendricks, Dean of the School of Nursing, and Ms. Karen Brown, Counselor for the Graduate College. I will begin today's defense with a question, and then Ms. Brule will give, provide you an overview of her dissertation research. Ms. Sproul, I'd like for you to tell us what qualifications do you bring to this dissertation research that allows you to serve as the PI? I think I bring a lot of qualifications to serve as the PI for this defense. Because when I think back on my career, I served 10 years as the nurse coordinator, nurse manager for Project Sugar that you will hear some about today. And I didn't turn the mic on, so let me just stop and turn the mic on. <laughs> Testing? Yes. yes. Let me start again. I bring many qualifications to act as the PI for this defense. Because when I have to reflect on my nursing career, I spent the last 10 years with a research project called Project Share that you'll hear more about later on. I was a co-PI and the project director for REACH 2010. I also was in charge of the clinical research unit at South Carolina State University. And so, and I was PI for a pilot grant that was funded by the, the Hampton Pen Health Disparity. So thank you for allowing me to do that, and welcome. <coughs> My title today, as you will see, is The Relationship Among Health Beliefs, Quality of Care, and Health Outcomes in Gullah Families with Type 2 Diabetes. I'm going to start first by telling you a little bit about diabetes. It is a complex metabolic disorder. It is characterized by hyperglycemia. It is a chronic disease, and it has a slow, insidious start. It is lifelong, and it has no cure. So people who have diabetes have to learn to live with this for the rest of their lives. It is an economic burden to the US. It costs the United States $132 billion per year. It is the leading cause of amputations. It affects 6.8% or 20 million people. And the fifth leading cause of death. If we look at diabetes in African Americans, one, one would say, what is happening? Why is it so high among African Americans? There are 3.2 million African Americans with diabetes that are 20 years and older. 28% of women, 19, 28% of women, and 19% of men over 50 have diabetes. So, what should make you think about then? What is the problem? How do we frame this to be the statement of a problem? There is research that will document the quality, inequality of diabetes as it relates to minority populations. There is a quality gap in the chronic disease management of minority patients. And I'm going to define quality gap 
is defined as the differences between treatment and the success rate. African Americans have higher rates of complications because of poor glycemic control. And South Carolina has high rates of diabetes, diabetes complications, and hypertension. CDC was concerned about the quality of care among patients that had diabetes. So they did a diabetes report card. Results from that report card showed that people were not having annual foot exams, and that 18% of the people who had diabetes had an A1C that was over 9.5. And what is critical here is that the normal A1C is less than 7, as recommended by ADA. The Institute of Medicine said that all racial and ethnic minority groups in the United States, I don't care what they were, receive lower qualities of health care regardless of their economic status, their health insurance coverage, their age, or the presence of comorbid conditions. The National Health and Nutritional Survey also talked about, yeah, we agree, there is a problem. But we also say that in terms of hypertension, hypertension in this country is 25%. But if you look at hypertension among African Americans, it is all the way up at 37%. Which means we can talk about Project Sugar for a bit. I won't dwell here long. I'll try not to, Dr. Hammond. But it's easy, so forgive me if I do, because I spent the last 10 years with this project, so it is, it's my heart. And I'm going to share a little bit because the study provided the data for my dissertation. SUGAR is an acronym that stands for Sea Island African American Genetic Registry. It received funding both private and public from WM Keck Foundation out of California. This is a snapshot view of so many things to give you some indications of the projects involved with the community. It had community guidance to tell it how to, how to um, proceed with the research among a vulnerable population. It garnished community respect. It garnished and provided community partnerships and provided community services throughout the community. You will see that there is a bus that used to call the sugar van. And something where in there is, uh, is me. <laughs> Let me say other two things about Project Sugar, then I'll move on to the reason why we're truly here today. And that is that one of the things the project was able to do was identify within the subset of the populations, the UCP uncoping gene is called the UCP3. And this gene can be, I like to think of it as a protective mechanism, but the UCP is a transmembrane carrier which regulates the body's ability to burn fuel. In times of famine, if a person has this mutation in their genes, they would survive. But in times of feasts, like America, with our high carb, high carb, high carb, high carb race, <laughs> westernized diets, it is difficult. It becomes problematic. So what happens is that people end up getting fat. The second thing I want to point out about Project Sugar, let me just, before I do that, is that let me just read you something about the thrifty gene, because I want to make sure you get the essence of it. Because in layman's term, we call it the thrifty gene for people to understand. And that is important because as we talk to the people in the communities about being predisposed to the UCP gene, we did not want it to be a stigma or have people think something is wrong with them. So lots of times what I say is that it's a protect protective mechanism. Remember sickle cell anemia? You don't get malaria. So think of it as if your ancestors survived, they passed it on. 
but it doesn't mean something is wrong with you. You just have to work hard and keep the weight off. Now, one theory suggests that some cases of type 2 diabetes and obesity are derived from a normal genetic action that were once important for survival. Some experts postulate the existence of a so-called thrifty gene, which, as I said earlier, regulates hormonal fluctuations to accommodate seasonal changes. In certain populations, the hormones were released during the seasons when food supply was low. And then when food supply was readily available, it switched again. Because modern industrialization has made high-carb diets and foods available all the time, the gene no longer serves a purpose. So now when somebody has this gene, they are sometimes see it as a liability. But as I said to you earlier, I don't like to think of it as a liability because I think the folks have enough on their plates already to talk about what's wrong and put another burden on them. The last thing I want to mention about Project Sugar is that the CPR recruitment model. The CPR recruitment model <clears throat> was developed to recruit the patients into the study. This is what it looks like. It has lots of community support. And, and what I want to, you to take away from the slide is that as we talk about engaging the community, you have to provide a service for the recruitment. You have to give people something. You just can't go in and do helicopter research and leave. Now let's talk about the significance, significance of the problem in South Carolina. As we compare it with the U.S. So if I said, if you looked at South Carolina, you see that we surpassed the national rate of diabetes. But what I want you to focus on is diabetes in South Carolina as it relates between African Americans and, and whites. In whites, it's 7.3 percent. In African Americans, it is 15 percent, so it's doubled. So do you think we have a problem? Okay. Now, what is the significance of the problem in South Carolina in the Low Country? We define the Low Country as nine counties that are also known as the home of the gullies. Two thirds of diabetes related deaths are due to heart attacks, and the Low Country, with the nine counties I'm going to cite for you, has the highest percentage of diabetes and diabetes related complications. Those counties are Charleston, Beaufort, Berkeley. Collington, Ori, and I grew up in Ori, Georgetown, Hampton, Jasper, Dorchester, and Bamberg. And these were also the counties that we used to recruit the participants for Project Sugar. And why is this important? What I want to do about this? This is my statement of purpose. The purpose of this study is to explore the relationship among health beliefs, quality of care, and health outcome in Gullah families with type 2 diabetes. The quality gap in diabetes care in Gullah families with type 2 diabetes is a major concern, and the problem has not been studied extensively by nurses and or the medical profession. Recall that I said that quality of care was the difference between success of the, the, the differences was, was between success rates and what you achieve in terms of care. If we looked at pertinent literature to talk about trying to support quality of care in diabetes, whether or not it was provided to minorities, there are several studies that we can we can reference. Marshall in 2005 concluded that African Americans have a high rate of diabetic complications because of racial disparities in health. Sequence concluded that patient engagement is essential, but that many patients don't even know how to take care of themselves. They don't know how to take care of diabetes. Hessler concluded that blood sugar control is associated with inadequate diabetes care. So all these folks are saying something is wrong here. 
something is not connected here. People are not being cared for. Research, and then research from the Diabetes Control and Prevention Trial said, now look, you guys can minimize the complications of diabetes if you follow minimum guidelines from ADA. Which brings me to the preliminary data from Project Sugar Data Set. This pilot study was funded by Hampton Penn Disparity Grant, and the purpose of this pilot study was to describe diabetes, blood pressure control, and diabetic complications in the developers who participated in this project. And you will see, again, that you, you will see the elevations in the fasting blood sugar. We had 53.7% of those folks had fasting blood sugar that was over 126. So we, we also concluded that there was some complications that exist in that population as well. So we concluded and concurred with other national studies. Now I want to turn your attention a little bit and talk a little bit about the Gullah population. And I'll try not to dwell here too long either. But sometimes that's difficult because that population is dear to me as well because that's, that was our subject population and partly also because this I grew up as well. When we think of the origin of the name, there is not any real consensus as to how it started, because people have different terms and, and say of what, where did it come from. You can talk about Gullah Geechee. Gullah really refers to linguistic patterns and cultural behavior of the people of South Carolina. Geechee, on the other hand, sometimes refer to people in Georgia. But growing up in Orby County, anybody in South Carolina, didn't matter if you went up low, we thought of as Gullah and Geechee, didn't matter. And so growing up, I thought that perhaps maybe I wasn't Geechee or Gullah. And it was like, duh, anybody from South Carolina is Gullah, they eat rice. And so <laughs> what I know a lot of times is that negative connotations was associated with the word. It was almost as bad as the N-word because people thought that being dull was something bad and that you look funny and you talk funny. The origin of the name, if you look at it, there were, there's a country called Angola in Central Africa. So if Gullahs are the, 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 the descendants of enslaved Africans, when those Africans were brought to this country to work, some came from Angola, thus Gullah. Some came from Nigeria, or the Kisi tribe, thus Geechee. Some said, well, it's Native American, so it's like the Ogeechee River. And so it was like, well, we're not quite sure where it comes from, because we do have a river in South Carolina and Georgia that's called the Ogeechee River. So we just said, all right, it's Gullah, and we're okay with it. It is now changed some in terms of the connotations because it has been a survival of the culture. I think because they were like a culture incubator, they were overstudied by behavior scientists. So as a result, they are very distrustful and difficult to, to participate in research. And so when I said the partnership was successful and recruited 600, over 600 families, that's a big deal because they did not readily open to people coming in trying to do research. The other thing that would make the Gullah population a little bit distinct from other people, other African Americans, is that because they were isolated by geography and climate, they maintained their cultural ties and, and a lot of the languages and, and the customs. The food I told you about earlier was rice. And you know rice is the high carbs, right? If you're talking about carbs, and somebody trying to control blood sugars, you're talking about changing somebody's life, social history, socialization of it. The folks in the nine counties in South Carolina, the girls, only just the girls in South Carolina, when compared with other African Americans in this country, had the lowest admixture than any other group. 
they had the lowest genetic admixture, so which, which means that it made them have almost a pure genetic pool. And that is the reason why Project Sugar chose that population for that genetic study, because they wanted a population that was, that was genetically homogeneous. So I will move on, because I don't want to get stuck with the others, because I can do that, because it's dear to me. I want to talk a little bit about Ms. Emma Jean King with her conceptual framework. She has an open system framework that consists of three interacting systems, personal, interpersonal, and social systems. And I tell you, I had the opportunity to call Dr. King. One of my colleagues, Dr. Gomes, came in with him, my item. You have to get permission to use blah, 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 blah. I'm like, okay. So I spent all this time trying to run this woman down, trying to figure out how do I get in touch with her, how do I get in touch with her. On the internet trying to, so I finally found her. God called four people that had the same name and the same initials and found it. This little lady answered for me. She goes, hello. And I said, Dr. King? And she says, yes. Now I'm going to fall out of my chair. Because I was like, Dr. Imogen King? Yes. <laughs> so then I, we had a conversation. So we talked about what I'm trying to do. Now she is consumed with trying to take care of her sister. Because my, my intent was calling her to ask her, could I use, use her systems in, in my dissertation? I also wanted to use one of her uh, drawings, and, and what we never got it because she's consumed taking care of her. I should leave it back up. She made sense still. Okay. But she is consumed taking care of her older sister. And I said to her, Isn't it a shame that you spent your entire nursing life making a difference in nursing and, and making, a, making a, a difference here and doing things? And you have to be subjected to the treatment that you get now with your sister at this hospital because she was treat, being treated very badly with her system. The personal system has the following concepts. You see those growth, body, space, time, learning. And learning was actually added later because in 1981 she didn't have learning in, um, in her system. The interpersonal system included Communication, interactions, role, stress, coping, and I'm going to go through these quickly because I'm going to tell you which one of these I pulled out to use in my dissertation. The social systems consist of interpersonal systems and included the following social roles, authority, organization, power, status, decision making. And this is the conceptual uh, system. And what happens here is that out of the personal systems, I pulled out body image, perceptions, growth and development, self and learning. And I try to link it to variables within the study so that I can try and answer the questions that I propose to myself. From the interpersonal systems, I pulled out transaction and communications. And from the social systems, I pulled out concepts, I pulled out word, uh, decision makers and power, as I said earlier. Now, my research design is non-experimental and is cross-sectional. It's descriptional, correlational, and it's secondary data analysis from the Project Sugar data set. And let me just kind of back up and tell you a little bit about secondary data analysis. We define it as you use existing data to answer another question. And so what I did was use Project Sugar data set and simply ask another question about the population. My sampling uh, and settings were African American gullah families that were born or raised in the Seattle's, and we had study criteria, and they had to be 12 or older, and you had to have two or more family members that, that were diagnosed with diabetes. And of course, they had, to, they had to come from the nine counties of South Carolina. In terms of my sample size and our effect, because there was not a whole lot of research done on this particular population about this particular problem, there was nothing to go to the pool to say what kind of sample size somebody has used to do this. So what I ended up doing, and as advised by reading in Pollock's book, was that when you know, when you, can, when you say you know what your effect size is, and you know what your <coughs> alpha level is going to be, and your power analysis, that you can actually calculate or go to a table and say, this is, this is what I want to use. So what I did was I said, well, my significance for this study is going to be 0 0.1 level. My power is going to be 80, because that's the minimum, what they require. 
And I was going to do a small effect size because I have such a large sample size. And when I took that and went to the charts, it said, in order for you to do this item, you got to have 1,171 people. And I said, that's okay, because my sample size is 1,276. Okay? So, I'm saying, here we go. What is my research question? What do I want to know? I'm saying, is there a relationship among health beliefs, quality of care, and health outcomes in Bella families with type 2 diabetes? I'm asking that question because I believe that there is a relationship. I believe something is going on between these three variables. King said, when the, when the relationships between the elements and the interaction leads to transaction, the goal would be obtained. My question number two. Is there a relationship between perceptions about the inheritance and prevention of diabetes, self-management behaviors, and health outcomes in the Gullah families of South Carolina? I still said, I think that there's a relationship. I think something is going on. Because King said, the perception of both the nurse and the client influences the interaction process. Now I'm also looking at the moderated effect, Dr. McGee, as well. Is there a relationship between insurance status, education, and glycemic control among the Gullah populations? Again, I said, I think it is. I hypothesize that this is happening. King said, there will be a positive relationship when family members are helped to maintain a state of health that permits functioning in social roles. So which leads me to then, so what do we do about this, these problems that I have? How do I go about and try to do some data collection? What, what would be the procedures here? Well, you know I said earlier this is secondary data now, so I'm going to have to go out and try to pull this in. But what I have to be aware of and get permission to do is that anytime you use secondary data analysis, you have to secure agreements from the principal investigators. So I had to go and secure the permission to do this from the principal investigator and from the Citizens Advisory Committee. And what was nice for my former PI to say to me was, well, gee, I don't know why you have to ask, can you use this? You work with this population, it's your data too. But we still had to do a formal process and we had to go through to the schools and have the schools say it's okay to share this data. We identified the variables and I created a secondary data um, set. What I want to note here too is that with the secondary um, set, when we looked at 1276, what I tried to do was maximize all my data and not lose it. But sometimes there were cases, perhaps, that did not answer all the questions. So when we ran the programs, we did like the um, list-wise, which when we ran it, just kind of say, if you got 1276, you only have information on 900, that's all we're going to run it on. And this is just to show you the, the sheet that talks about the Citizen Advisory Committee. It's where I went to make the, the presentation to use the data. And these groups down here had to do the same. SLAY is a lupus study, it's a systemic lupus study in the USC, and they wanted to use the Gullah population, so they had to come to the Citizens Advisory Committee and say, can we? By then, other folks were savvy in terms of how to ask questions and deal with research. COBRA, uh, same thing, which is the biomedical research that dealt with oral health. They had to come before the same group and ask for permission to use the data. And um, the Office of Women's Health, we, just, we had a grant for two years to do uh, education. If we talk about instrumentation, I didn't know about instruments until I came to grad school to work on my PhD. Because I tell you, working um, all those years at Project Sugar, we actually developed an instrument, which is the Family Health Questionnaire. What I didn't know you call it, the questionnaire until I went to Dr. McGovern's class and she was like, um, we're doing survey, you know, we're doing, and I was like, well, is this an instrument? She was like, 
yes, it is. So I said, we develop, I developed an instrument. She said, yes, you did. Okay. And I was like, oh, okay. So, you know, so I did not know about how do you, you know, instrument, why it was so important until actually I got here. So that's, 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 that's one of the ways I, I think that we can mesh clinical and, and, and education. The, the questionnaire had three sections, all about me, all about my diabetes, and all about my family. You know, sometimes the nurses call it a book because it was so thick. It also, it, we also had the physiological measurements. It had two phases, the preclinical phase and the clinical phase. And the preclinical phase was the clinical assessments. And the clinical phase is where they actually collected the blood specimens from the patients in the, in the primary study. The data analysis that we chose to use for this was going to be the statistics, t-test, chi-square, Muller regressions, and Pearson product moments. I said earlier about the demographics. Uh, African American population, we have 1,276, 1,276 people. 77.7% were .7 female, 39.8% were married, 45.8% went to high school or had some high school. 69.9% had insurance, and 360 preferred to learn in a group. I only reported to you the highest frequencies um, here. If we looked at the physiological profiles of this particular population, uh, you will see again that, I'll bring attention to, if you look at the only thing that's kind of abnormal here is the fasting glucose, which is 148, and the A1C2. But the lipids are fairly decent. And one of the things that's different about this population is that they have some kind of protective mechanisms to, for lipid. And, and there's, there's some research now being done on it to, to figure out what it is that causes them to have such, when they have high blood sugar, they turn around and have a, a decent lipid level. One of the, the um, studies that's being done now is by Dr. Sumner and NIH, and then Dr. Garvey is still looking at this protective mechanism that these folks have such good lipid levels in spite of their blood sugars. But the other thing to say about this is that because we talk so much about the negative parts of how bad these stats are in terms of this population, what comes to mind is that as I talk to and I remember the CAC, one of the things that the, um, Mr. Jenkins said to me was, Ms. Anna, please say something good about us sometimes. We are so tired of people always talking about how bad we are, how sick we are, and what is happening. Say something good. So lots of times I have an opportunity to say something good, I will, because I remember Mr. Jenkins in my ears. And let's talk a little bit about health beliefs in this particular population. 61.6, 61.1% believe that diabetes is inherited. 66.6% .6 believe that it can't be prevented. And I was really kind of amazed, happy but a little amazed. 11.8% said they use some kind of home remedy. I thought it was unreported, but I can't say that because I'm just looking at the data. But the highest frequency when they talked about they use home remedies was, was garlic, whole home tea, vinegar and water, my sister's laughing, alopecia, ball celery, cherry bark, golden seal, herb tea, peach kernel, and lemon juice. Some of the ones that didn't record as often were things like the snake roots or moss in the shoe. And then one actually sounded good where someone said they put the apples and the celery in the blender um, to water the diabetes. But recall, I told you that when I talked about the gullas, they have strong beliefs in terms of home remedies and roots. But that's why I was a little surprised when only 11.8% responded. Now let's talk about all this. So, where do we go with this and what were the results? If we talk about research question one, is there a relationship? Is there not a relationship between the quality, the, release, the quality of care 
and health outcomes in developed families with type 2 diabetes? Well, the research said that it was statistically significant. So duh, it, it rejected the null hypothesis saying that it wasn't. So there's a relationship there. And so I'm saying, then look at this. Because I want you to see that if you looked at the, the correlation, you'll see one of the things to see is that as, as numbers are higher, they keep going up, or if they're low, they're low. So if you looked at complications here and you looked at beliefs, you see this is a point 49. Here would be a point 48, and then A1C down here. But you see A1C high here, and it's also high here. So we're saying that we were significant at the 0 0.01 level, which makes it much more powerful than 0 0.5. Question number two, is there a relationship between perceptions about inheritance and relationships between self-management and health outcomes in adult families? And we talk about self-management because in King's model, we talk about self-management in the CTE model. So that's how we're making this, these two together here. But we also say, again, aha, the relationship exists. It is significant. So the null hypothesis is rejected. Then I'll show you what the, again, you see. New diet, new class. You see the relationships between them. You see the little stars saying it's significant at the 0, 0.0 level. And then question number three. Is there a relationship among insurance status, education, and glycemic control in families with type 2 diabetes? Again, it said, yes, it is. So you're not too wrong, Adam. You was not too much off track. A relationship exists. It is significant at the 0 0.01 level. And again, I provide you with the, the correlation to look at to see that there is a, there is a um, relationship between those variables. Now if I talk about limitations of this particular study, well, sampling biases are inherited in any studies. This is the secondary data analysis. One of the advantages of, of a secondary data analysis is that if the person doing the research is involved in it, then that's a plus. Because I was involved in the collection and the recording of the data, and it made it a plus for me to use this data set because I was familiar with what it was and what it did. In the primary data set, there may have been some problems with the recording and collection of data, only in the sense that we had five different nurses collecting information from who goes with people. You had nurses who were tired, they asked something wrong, they wrote the answers wrong. And so sometimes the information may be a little difficult to, to try to interpret. But what I wanted to, to focus on in terms of limitations of secondary dollar analysis as it relates to this particular study is that is that are self-reported. Because I think when patients reported self-complications, when they said the eye, feet, leg, foot, whatever was hurting, we didn't have, unless it was something that was obvious that you could see, the complications, we could not validate that they had these problems. And so we were limited in terms of self-reported. If they said, I exercise, and I exercise four or five times a day. We had to take that. If they said, um, I don't use home remedies, that's self-reported. So you have to just accept what they give you. You can't, nothing, and that's one of the, I think, the limitations would have been. My conclusions. Yes, I am so excited to be a nurse researcher. I am so excited to share with you what my findings were. For an example, Lack of insurance does not affect the quality of care. What was interesting and surprising to me was that 69.9% .9 of this population had insurance, but they also had high complications. So it makes you think, what, what was wrong? What's, what's happening? Where's the disconnect going on? You think if somebody got insurance, they go to the doctor, if a doctor is available. But the doctor has to be available and accessible. Health beliefs and quality of care accounts for only 22% of the complications, Dr. McGee, when I looked at, at the um, mother of regression here. Only 22%, only 22% of the 
the least and the quality of care affected the complications, which make you answer the, ask the question, what else is responsible? What else is going on? What else do we need to look at that caused this to happen? There was a large variance in the physiological results, which indicates other factors may be responsible for complications. It could have been the gender severity of the diabetes. Not sure. The locations. And then also, we conclude that home remedies continue as a popular alternative medicine. That over 50% of the participants believe that diabetes can be prevented or inherited, but they still have complications. You would think that if you believe that diabetes can be prevented, you would act to change. You would change your, your health-seeking behaviors. You would understand the severity of the disease and move to action. But somehow, our little population didn't do that. They believe it, yes, but they were not moved to change anything, so it makes you wonder, what is it? Is diabetes truly a family affair? Is it really all in the family? Do we believe you just want to get sugar anyway? Is it a self-fulfilling prophecy? You just let it go, so what do you do? Then what are the implications for nursing? What would I leave my colleagues with? And I'd say that secondary data analysis can be a viable option for nurses involved in research who have an access to a large database. Clinicians should design programs that are culturally specific to the population, and that nursing educators should expose students to nursing theories and illness management models related to chronically ill patients. My recommendations for research, but for the research, is that, and Dr. Connor will probably love to hear this, is that we should design qualitative research studies to explore the learned, the lived experiences of Gullah families with diabetes, because it's not been done yet. And I, we'd like to explore the use of sacred and personal alternative medicines among the Island populations. We need to develop culturally appropriate intervention projects for this chronically ill population. And then we develop these projects, we have to keep in mind these folks want to learn in groups, have group activities, and then do the education. And then lastly, we want to talk about how do you explore the barriers to genetic literacy among the Gullah population. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Cool. I will begin the question and answer session by having first the dissertation committee ask questions. We will then uh, follow those questions with um, questions from Dr. Whitney and uh, Ms. Karen Brown and our dean from the School of Nursing prior to having others in the audience ask their questions. So we will get to all of your questions this afternoon if you just be patient with us. Um, Dr. Davis. I'm really interested in, uh, you told us why you did the secondary data analysis, mm -hmm. but what I want to know is what are the advantages? Because we know many people don't allow students to do secondary data analysis, mm -hmm. and many people don't allow other researchers in the research environment to do secondary data analysis. So I'm wondering what advantage do you see uh, of doing secondary data analysis? I think one of the, the first advantages is that nurses have advantages, they have opportunities to large data set. Nurses work with patient at patient's records, so it's back there, so they, they have it. The advantage would be that it's cost effective, that it's t that it, in terms of time as well. And it, it also allows you to ask other questions of a research problem. Other advantages would be that um, when you use secondary data analysis, it forces you to, and I am saying this for me as well, empirical indicators are difficult sometimes. 
it's difficult sometimes in the, when you do secondary data analysis. Well, yes, it, yes, an advantage is that that that, that it is cost effective and time wise as well. But I don't want people thinking that secondary data analysis is just easy either. It is not and was not an easy process. It was difficult and still is difficult when you use secondary data analysis to try to fit the questions with a theorist. And this is documented in the literature too, is that when people do primary studies, it's easier for you to fit it. Because you know what you're doing, you know what the question you're asking, you know what you, well, when you do secondary data analysis, you are stuck with what you have. You make the best of what you have. And then you have to figure out, do I have to change my variables? It's not working. Do I have to change my nursing theorists? Um, if it's not working. So I don't want people to leave it, away, leave it thinking that, oh, it's just easy to start there. Now, no, it was not easy. It was challenging as well. Okay, and my last question is, uh, how did you decide to do um, between theory generating and theory testing? Why that is that or how? How? Well, that's a good question, Dr. Davis. <laughs> because I tell you, for one time, I thought I was doing theory generating. <laughs> so I actually did theory testing. The difference, is, the difference would be is that when I was talking about trying to theory generate, I was trying to come up with a theory, as opposed to trying to test a theory, trying to test the thing I already had. And so what I, my theory with the population was that I thought something exists between us, I'm trying to test the relationship. But what did you... What did you go through to determine what it came out to as theory test? I'm not sure I understand. When you when you discussed theory testing, mm -hmm. and you had the um, you had drawn it out yes, as theory did. as theory yes. <laughs> as theory generated yes yes, uh, yeah, and I'm asking you this so that the students here can understand how you got from theory testing to, to uh, from theory generating to, to theory testing. One of the things that people helped me zero in on it was that in theory testing and in theory generating, there was, not, there was not a whole lot of information already out there. And I thought that, that if there's no information out there, then I can generate a theory. Okay. <laughs> but that wasn't true, because what had to happen was if information exists, uh, it may not exist about what I wanted, yes. but it exists. Yes. So it had to be tested. Okay. And I just hope you all got that. That's what I wanted you to get to, because uh, we had to work with her, too. <laughs> I know my questions relate more to the research design statistical analysis. Mm -hmm. I have a question. You um, discussed your Pearson's product moment correlations, mm -hmm. the one that's linking your health beliefs with complications. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, some of the coefficients are quite low. In many mm -hmm. cases, they're bordering on what we consider mm -hmm. to be weak or negligible. Mm -hmm. And for example, the linkage between complications and HBAIC. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us exactly why you think that is? You've got such weak correlations in some of these. Well, that's a good question too, Dr. McGee. I, I, as I said earlier, the population was so diverse, okay, number one. If a correlation between the A1C and complications was, was, was low, it could be related to a lot of reasons. I, I'm not quite sure if I need to ask something else another way. I'm not sure. The relationship still exists. It may not have been as strong as the other ones, but it was there. If I, if I had to think in terms of, well, what would be the reason it would be at a point one eight eight as opposed to a 485, it just needs further investigation. We just need further investigation, because I can say that. And my second question deals more with the moderating effects. Um, looking at research question one, mm -hmm. to what extent did you find a moderating effect between poor quality of care? To what extent might that moderate the negative effect of negative health beliefs on type 2 diabetes complications? Well, in terms of the moderating effect, they all seem to have an effect on it. Um, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't go through the subset of questions that talked about those three questions, but 
in my, in my document, I talked about all of these had a relationship. It's the sort of relationship existed between them, and I actually listed out, I don't have it here, but I actually listed out what, the, what they actually were. Did you see any difference between your interactive effects and the main effects in these cases? Somewhat, somewhat, somewhat in terms of, of if it was interacting, I say, when we look at the clinical picture that we have, when we look at the diversity of what we have, when we look at the variance in all of the physiological indicators and responses, I can't really say, I mean, I, I really can't say, because I think perhaps I could have asked another question another way, because what actually happened as well is that I was disappointed that we only found 22%, that we could only account for 22% of the complications for, I mean, I, I thought that, I really thought I was gonna do better than that. I mean, I really thought that the research would show that these other variables had quality of care, health needs, had a strong effect on outcomes and what it did, but it did not. And I was disappointed in that, but I, I mean, I can't argue with the figures. So I, the best way I can answer that is that I'm not quite sure how, how else, um, except that something in terms of relationships existed between all those variables. It was not at the level that I thought it should have been, or at the levels that I would have, or, how can you say, um, if we looked at, let me put it another way, as I think about the relationships, and as I talk about that all of those, those variables were super significant, I'm not sure and because we use 0 0.0.1 as opposed to 0 0.5, I just feel comfortable that we were okay and that none of this happened by chance. Okay, thank you. Uh, just one question before I run to another meeting. Um, on the first conclusion, is there a reason that you have two negatives in the first part of that? You say the lack of insurance does not affect the quality of care. Is there a reason that you had that expressed in, in the public negative version? Let me see if I can I mean, understand. Can you saying. clarify it or, or word it positively so we can understand? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for telling me to do it positively. What I what I'm actually trying to say is that 69.9% of the people had insurance, but they still had complications. And perhaps I could just turn it around and say it another way, but no, there's no, I mean, there's, there's no reason I would have said it next. I mean, I can, I can rephrase that. But all I'm trying to, what I was trying to say to you all is that the data was showing that all these people had insurance, but they still had complications. And what accounts for that? Did they, have, did they have access to care? Did they have access to a provider? I'm not, and I'm saying they didn't, because the area is small, rural, and we don't have services there. So the language wasn't driven by the questionnaire. I mean, the language for lack of insurance was not something part of the questionnaire, so you had to use it for that reason. It was part of, it was the way the question was constructed. That's, that's what the question was. Okay, well it has to be worded the way the question was constructed, but it may require a paraphrase so it's very clear as to what it means. I'd be glad to do that. Okay. Particularly if it makes it positive. Okay. It's positive as it can. Yes. I mean, basically there's no cure, and so insurance or not doesn't matter. Exactly, right. exactly. It supports the Institute of Medicine, actually, what they say. Right. Okay. I got a four o'clock. Ms. Mm -hmm. let me first commend you on an excellent study. I've been looking forward to this day to hear the results, <laughs> and I must say I am very pleased. Uh, I want to commend you again Although I, I hear you beating yourself up mm -hmm. about the 22% variance explained. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure that your statistician will agree with me that in social science research, 22% is pretty good. And so it, as nurses, we tend to want a lot higher. Yeah. I, I know, but I want to let you know 
That 22% is not bad. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely great. Um, I also want to say to you that uh, we want to commend you on selecting uh, your lived experience mm -hmm. of being a part of a real study mm -hmm. and using that and what we would uh, probably, I guess, put it under the translational piece. So thank you for making something that you really believe in mm -hmm. an important part of science. Uh, your limitations, you talked about the uniqueness of the, of the sampling bias. Mm -hmm. You didn't sell me on that. Okay. Because you sold me that the Gullah population was unique mm -hmm. and special. Mm -hmm. And so, I differ with you that that's a bias. Don't 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 give in on that. Okay. You've done something special. You have added to the science. We look forward to seeing more of your work in print because you've already started. Mm -hmm. You have. I let your chair glow. Probably <laughs> six publications already. For those who don't know, mm -hmm. she comes to this dissertation with at least six publications under her belt, and we are most proud of you. Thank you, Dean Hendricks. Um, we're going to let Dr. Loudon ask a question I actually forgot. Dr. Loudon? Thank you, Dr. Hammond. Um, can you begin by talking to me about the reliability of your study? Um, you have five nurses. So, did you make any attempt to? look at interrater reliability to see, for example, if what they were getting from those five nurses, they were seeing the same things, since this is self-reported data. And specifically, could you have used a subsample of the data collected and look at some clinical records to see if there were any independent verification of the self-reported conditions your population reported? I think I heard you say that loud. I think I heard what you said. I'm, you asked me first about the reliability of the <laughs> instrument. Did you have five nurses in the study. Yes, we did. We had five nurses, five different nurses from five different areas. Right. And, and the reliability was we did interrail okay. reliability, okay. where the principal investigator myself mm -hmm. looked at the nurses in terms of how they conducted the interviews. Yes. Looked at the questionnaires, mm -hmm. did content validity, yes. construct validity, and we were read at about 90% most of the time. Oh, I'm impressed. Okay. We um, took. <laughs> 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 what did you do then? Um, look at some clinical records by pulling, say, a subsample of chart to correlate with the self reported information. For this particular study or for what? Yeah, for this particular study. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind out loud that was not part of my research question. It's an interesting question. I'm not, I love to do it. And the other thing is that we didn't have, always have access to those records because sometimes the nurses did the home visits um, and sometimes they did the, the, the work in the patient's clinic, mm -hmm. home visit, hospital. Mm -hmm. So if you recruited a patient at home and sometimes they got them where they could, if, they had to meet somebody at work early, fast yeah. before they went to work. It was difficult to try to get a hold of all those folks' records. Records that we were able to gather, we could. Things that we could do is that when we, because um, all the participants had to have all this blood work done, we did lipid panels, you know, fatty-free acids, a C-peptide. We did all of this blood work for them. When those results came back, we had those records that we could have looked at. Sure. And those records also were sent to the patient's physicians as well. Sure. Did, and did the you collect any information on the reading age of your population? I sure did. And what was it like? You mean in terms of whether or not it was 6th, 7th, or 8th grade? Yes, the reading level of the Well, South Carolina has a literacy level of 8%, oh. about 8th grade percent. But in terms of looking at, um, most of the folks in, my, in, my, in our sample, when we looked, when we broke it down, mm -hmm. they had some, we broke it down to high school, you know, some high schools, middle schools, some middle schools, and high school and beyond. Most of the people were in the category of some high school, leading me to believe that they didn't finish high school. Okay. And we had a couple that didn't 
go to school at all. Thanks. Thanks. I just have two very quick questions. Um, with respect to racial disparity in the population, it's quite clear that if we're targeting prevention, what do you think we should be doing differently in targeting prevention messages to this particular population? What is it we are not doing in health education that we should be doing? We have been saying cultural specific messages and so on, and yet on the other hand, your study shows 6% of the population felt that diabetes could be prevented. So what should we do to target our health information more productively to get better results? That's a very good question. I think one of the ways that we can, as, as I said in one of my conclusion recommendations, is that if programs can be designed to be culture specific to a particular population, if the girl folks, if we found out that they like to learn in, learn in groups, then programs ought to be designed that they can learn in groups. Mm -hmm. If we say that they believe it can be, or if they report that they walk and they actually don't, but suppose it was true, when they step report the exercise of walking, then we could develop programs of walking in the rural area where they could actually walk, since it's less costly. Mm -hmm. I think also as we design programs for isolated vulnerable populations, you have to take into account their belief systems as well. And oftentimes, we don't do that. We simply come in, give a program, and go on. And then we blame the patients because they don't participate and because nothing has changed. And that's why diabetes can be so frustrating at times because it is difficult to control um, when patients don't quite understand, as I said earlier in the lit review, patients don't know how to take care of their diabetes. You have to have a certain kind of literacy level that goes beyond school. You have to be able to understand and follow instructions. You have to be able to understand how do you take your medicine. You have to understand if I don't take my medicine, what's going to happen to me? When you tell me to test my blood sugar once or twice a day, the skips cost a dollar, I don't have it, I'm not going to test it. So I think lots of times what happens, particularly when we talk about a chronic disease like diabetes, we don't get into patients, really the lived experience of patients with diabetes, because it is totally different. And when people have diabetes, you've got that for the rest of your life. You've got to learn to adjust and adapt. So, so part of the health message be then, in terms of the health education curriculum, should part of that be a shock and awe by saying to your patient, you are likely to lose a limb, you are likely to go blind, in terms of letting people use their belief system to cognitively understand the magnitude of the illness? You may, but I don't think that would work because, I, I, because they believe it can be prevented. And I, so I wouldn't want to shock them. The other thing is that lot, one of the sayings they have in the, in, in the low country is that I ain't claiming it. I ain't claiming it can be taken and reconstructed to mean something positive. Okay. If we could take that and say I ain't claiming it and make it preventive, then yes. But I wouldn't particularly want to, to um, shock them because they don't believe, I mean, apparently if they believe, you know, when I looked at the belief system, I don't know if they know how severe it is because they're not moved to change. If they believe that it can be prevented in her, but they still got complications and something else is going on. Okay. And my final question briefly is, um, in terms of beliefs and action, can you say anything about faith-based approaches? Do you think in the cultural specific approach you are mentioning uh, that there's any evidence for a faith-based in terms of people's belief systems? There was one study in Guatemala Island that a church had an exercise group, and it was in the church they did praise worship. And that seemed to be effective because the little old ladies loved coming in to praise worship because all they had to do was sit and do the little exercises. And so in that sense, it, it worked. But I don't know of any others at this point that, that, would, that would be faith-based. And I think we have to be careful with the faith-based initiative as well. In the rural areas, church are sacred, and sometimes people don't want to mix the church with health prevention. And so if the pastor says, I don't want this, this, this is secular, then it's not going to happen. So in that sense, I, I have to look at both, both sides. I wouldn't say no, but I'd be careful as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Love. Um, Dr. Burns. Anyway, Miss Allen, you did excellent call. Tell me, I'll be here. I'm interested in the model. 
King. Why did you select King? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you, uh, what do your findings speak to? What you say about King's model? Mm -hmm. And you develop a theory from her model. How difficult did you find that? Because it's a process. Yes, it's a process. And um, just how did you select her? I selected King because diabetes is a chronic disease. And I selected her because she has the theory of gold attainment. And she talks about provider and client getting together, setting a mutual goal to make a difference in their, in their health. I like her theory because I advocate sitting down with clients because people who have diabetes got to manage. They have to be in control. They have to be part of the medical management regime, and sometimes they are not. So the main reason I chose King was because of her. Even though I did the open systems theory, I didn't do the goal of attainment, I was attracted to the goal of attainment theory. Okay? But most importantly, because diabetes is a chronic disease, and she had one of the models that I thought fit best with what I was trying to do. And yes, it was a difficult process, even if trying to develop a theory or trying to test a theory with secondary dial analysis, I would say it again. It was not easy for folks who, and my colleagues and colleagues coming behind me, for folks who didn't have to do secondary dial analysis, it was probably easy for them to grasp it and let it flow. But when you do secondary dial analysis, you gotta make all that bad boy fit. Yeah, and you have to give, you got to make it fit. And sometimes if it's not going to work, you have to let it go. And I was determined because I, I, I believe in King's, in, in King's saying, systems interact. That nurses need to interact with clients. That nurses need to be able to say this communication translation process is going on and something is happening. Because all of us bring something to an event. Your ideas, my ideas, and if they don't match, Nothing will, 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 will occur. So, you're, so, you're, so you're, you would suggest people use King? I mean, did you help King model <laughs> out any? But you know what? In another life, I would really like to do an article and talk about how I can use King to, with chronic diseases in the Gullah population. If, she, if we get on the right track and we can have some communication going on, serious communication, I'd really like to do that. Because I think as African American nurses, we don't do it enough, number one. Number two, it's difficult to do research and talk about a CTE and try to make it make sense to other people. We're not doing it. And so I think we have a responsibility that as we understand it, we ought to, we ought to publish it. And then answer your question about whether or not I would recommend it. I like her goal attainment theory because I like her saying, you got to sit down with the patient you got to figure out what the patient want, and you guys got to do this together. That's what I like about her. And for folks who want something that says, how am I going to involve the patient, I say yes. That is what I like about her. Well, you have a mid-range theory from her, Mom. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So you have your own theory. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You already passed. Yes, ma'am. So you need to name it and, and pray. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Condon. I had a congratulations. Your study is very, very well done. I had wanted just to go back to something that Dr. Burns said mm -hmm. about, um, about the theory model. You did, in fact, do some important testing, and one of the aspects of it was perceptions of patients. Because they must either believe that genetic intervention can do something, mm -hmm. or there's some kind of disconnect between what inheritance means mm -hmm. and exactly. that it can be cured. So it definitely generated. Awesome. There's a whole question right there. You can spend a lot of time <laughs> trying to find out the answer to that question. <laughs> the other part that uh, the interpersonal system and the quality of care, you really have to some transaction. How do we test transaction? No, no, it's, it's transaction. Yes, because it the transaction takes place. So, yes. Yes. so 
it, it's very, very useful for the study because mm -hmm. of those parts that you were able, able to test. And then on the last one, the social system and the health outcome, mm -hmm. there's a couple of things in there that I think that, um, that, that came, that came out, and that's the concept of power in organizations. Mm -hmm. So I think that, I think it was, it was good fit when you look at all those subconcepts in there. Well, and then when you take it back to the answers that you got uh, from your data mm -hmm. and, and examine it in the light of those concepts, you have a whole bunch of other questions that you could use still within the scope of this, this model. So I think, I think you really did pick the right one. I think so. I it wasn't this was up time to fit it. <laughs> yeah. I did. Well, it was. That's your, that's your answer. How useful was it? It was very useful. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. Kanye. Other questions? Good afternoon, Ms. School, and once again, congratulations. You did an excellent job. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, since you are from the area and uh, from the Gullah area, your other colleagues, nurses that were participants in the data collection, were they also um, residents of the area or lived in the area uh, as you know from being from there as well and did you find being someone that's the one that's oh okay <laughs> <Word. Yeah. laughs> thank you because I, I neglected to say that yes they were but one of the one of the criteria to hire the rest of the project was that it had to be local because it had to people had to be able to understand appreciate and respect and so once those nurses were hired into the projects, I did trainings with all of them. We did training on how do you do interviews, how do you get genetic information, how do you approach people, because remember, I'm a social worker too. And so we had, and these were nurses, and some of them were LPNs, so we had to make sure that they were dealing with a lot of, of, of sensitive information you ask about people's parentage, and sometimes they didn't have the same parent, they didn't know, so we had to deal with it, we had to deal with it a certain way. So, yes, they were from the area. And what, that's one of the reasons why the project was successful because the people respected the folks who came to gather the information. That, that, that was really going to be my second part. <laughs> Did you feel that that, because of the cultural uh, sensitivity of those which of the Gullah people, that that did make a difference, <laughs> that they felt that it was, you all were vested there because you were a part of the community? I think so, but you know what? The P.I. was not African American, he was not Gullah. So it, it goes back to if you have a genuine interest, and if you show, and people can feel it and know it, it doesn't matter. He was one of those scientists that was open to learn. He often laughed and said, We taught him to be human because when he first came to the project, all he wanted to do was collect blood. <laughs> it cannot happen like that. So what I want you to understand is that, yes, that made a difference, but there are people who are not african Americans that can do equally as well in terms of their research, but they've got to be sensitive, they've got to do stuff, and they've got to respect the culture. And one of the things he did was he took it upon himself to learn all he could about the quote-unquote color people. And sometimes when he does his little slot, when he does his little presentation all over the country, because he's well-known, um, published, funded. When he does it now, um, he talks about it in a, in a sensitive manner because we sensitize him to it. Other questions? Well, I'll ask mine now. Uh, now that you've gotten to this point, you know, like almost there. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to find out what your plans are for the future, um, your goals. Where do you go from here? Are you calling my future tomorrow? <laughs> Next week? I know you're trying to get to me. <laughs> well, no, right now you got to do seven days for Karen Brown. Right. <laughs> Uh, but yes, what, what are you? What are your plans? Where Where do you go from here? Where, after May, what do you think? Where do you think you'll be? I think that I will eventually end up back in South Carolina. My My ultimate goal is to return home with an intervention, a funded intervention study um, for the population there. But prior to that, I'd like to do some more research. I'd like to become um, 
how to say, I want to take this, I want to take this database set, Dr. McGee, and I really want to work it. I really want to take it and answer the questions you ask me. I want to take it and feel comfortable about anything I say or do with it, because it's mine now. I mean, it's part of mine too. So I want to claim and own it, and I want to, and I want, and I want to be able to, to do that. And in order to do that, I think I need some more. I need, I need to perhaps consider, and I'm considering a postdoc. I'm considering a uh, postdoc at NIH. I'm considering a postdoc at University of Pittsburgh, and and the one at Iowa. So I don't know. I mean, we have to we have to figure out what the best fit is. So the best way I can answer this is. I ain't done yet. I'm not going to follow that. No, no. <laughs> At this time, the committee will recess to room 131, and um, we should be back shortly. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I usually talk pretty loud because I got an Alabama voice. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and my honor to welcome, to introduce to you for the first time in public, Dr. Ida Johnson Scroop. Congratulations to Dr. Spoon. Yeah. 